New Testament. We'll be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. Let us pray. Father, we ask that the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate these words to us, that you would make them jump off the page into our hearts and our lives. We ask you to do something eternal this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to ask you a question this morning. How would you like a surefire way to be a success as a Christian? If you will pay attention to this sermon, you are guaranteed success as a Christian. Because after all, don't we want others to think that we are the most spiritual person they've ever known? Don't we want others to think we are the most humble person ever? Okay, seriously. Does this attitude reflect a person who is a disciple of Jesus Christ? And we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. As we continue to focus on discipleship, we find that there is a way of thinking that is totally opposite of what I just described, of how the world thinks. And what Paul lays out for us in these verses is so radical and countercultural, and yet, I will say this, if we live this way, we will be successful in God's eyes. Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi from a jail in Rome. Now, Philippians is often called the joy letter because Paul focuses on joy. Now, think about that. He's in jail, and yet he does not focus on his circumstances. He can find joy in the midst of trials. Now, what is it that leads to this kind of radical thinking? Because it is radical. Because if we were facing trials like Paul, we might not have joyful thoughts. So, what can lead to this new type of thinking? Well, here's the first characteristic that we see in these verses. We're to think a lot. Now, I know what you're thinking. Don, I thought we were supposed to use our own minds and not be robots. And can't we get in trouble if we all think alike? Doesn't that lead to brainwashing and don't, don't cults promote this kind of thinking? But think about this. What leads to conflict? It's obvious that conflict comes when we have differing viewpoints and we hold on to those viewpoints very strongly. And if we're all thinking differently, who's right? Well, of course, we're right. Of course, the other person thinks they're right. So where does all this lead? It's a conflict. And verse 2 basically says, 
there is to be no conflict in the church, that there is to be unity. But the key is, how do we achieve this like-mindedness? Well, for that to happen, we look at the next characteristic, which is humility. So, let me ask this first. What's the opposite of humility? It's pride. Now, what's wrong with pride, you ask? We're, we're proud of our children, proud of our grandchildren, proud of certain accomplishments, we're, we're proud of our homes, we're proud of our church, we're proud of our new addition. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's a destruct, destructive part of pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction. We often heard of pride goes before the fall. This type of pride, as defined in the Bible, it refers to being arrogant, exalting oneself. And verse 3 tells us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And King James uses, do nothing through strife or vain glory. Don't let pride be your God. Selfish ambition or strife, conceit or vainglory are, are manifestations of pride. It, it's it's the, the working out of pride in our life. It, it shows up in our words. It shows up in the things we do, in the attitudes we hold. Because what does strife and pride do to a community? A church is ruined by selfish ambition, strife, and pride as our relationships. Verse 3 continues, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Now, humility as used in the Bible is defined as lowliness of mind. In humility, we see ourselves as no better than anyone else. We, we think of others before we think of ourselves. Now, it does not mean that we beat ourselves up constantly or that we put ourselves down. That's false humility. And that is not healthy, nor is it what God intended. But what we realize is that we are no better than anyone else. We understand our true condition as sinners in need of salvation. In fact, salvation is impossible unless we are humble. Because if we are prideful, then we think we've got it all together. That we're good enough, and we don't need a Savior. The Bible says we are to look to the interests of others and not our own. But we ask, well, who look out for me then? Well, first of all, humility will not ask that question. And secondly, if we look out for each other... That means someone's looking out for us. Isn't that cool? That's how God intended for community to function. So, what is the antidote for pride and the source for humility? So, if, if we're to think alike, what is our model? Oh, who is our model? Ah, here we go. The key verse is verse 5. We are to have the same mind as Jesus. When we say we should think alike, that's what we need. We're to think like Jesus. Now, if, if we all think like Jesus, what would the world look like? How would we treat others? Disciples of Jesus Christ are to have the same mind as Jesus. Think what the church could accomplish if we thought like Christ. And Jesus shows us how people are supposed to think and to be. He was the perfect human. You see, the way we think is expressed in how we act and, and what we say. Jesus said, out of the mouth, you reveal what you're like inside. The real us will eventually show up in our words and our actions. But we see in the life of Jesus true, unselfish, 
always thinking of others, humility, and love. Jesus, who lived in perfect harmony with the Father, left heaven. He left that behind to come to earth. Verse 6 says, Jesus is God in human flesh. Now doesn't that just blow our minds? Verse 7 says, He emptied Himself of the glory in heaven to take on human flesh. He left the splendor of heaven to come down here on earth and live among us for 33 years. Now, imagine what heaven is like. You know, one of our favorite songs today is I Can Only Imagine. We really can't imagine. We have descriptors in the Bible. What is heaven going to be like? Beyond anything we could even imagine. Now, compare that to life here on earth. Jesus left heaven to come here. I mean, we all long to be in heaven someday. And Jesus left it to come here so that we could leave here to go there. Amen? Jesus lived his life in obedience to the will of the Father. As we just said, not my will, but thy will be done, Jesus said. Jesus never took advantage of his divine nature for personal gain or glory. Never did anything that brought him glory. He was obedient. It was always to direct people to the Father. Verse 8 says, he was obedient to the will that said, I will take the punishment they deserve. Obedient to the point of death on the cross. Well, let that soak in. Who deserved to die for their sin? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> we did. And yet Jesus, sinless, perfect, God in human flesh, went to the cross for us. He did it on purpose. He did it to satisfy the penalty we owed for our sin. Punished in our place. Shed his blood for us. Uh, we maybe have seen this on Facebook. You know, one pint of blood saves, what, four or five lives? But one drop of blood has saved all of humanity. He was punished in our place so that we could be free to live in relationship with God the Father. Verse 9 says, because of the obedience of Jesus as our human sacrifice, as our atonement, which means everything's made right, God exalted Jesus. We see that on that first Easter morning. A lot of people have died for causes. A lot of people have died for other people. But no one was resurrected by God himself. To bring glory and show us that death has been defeated. God raised Jesus from the dead and 40 days later took him up to heaven where he lives today. So we look at verses 10 and 11 and we see what our response should be. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Where? Well, just about everywhere. In heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We owe everything to Jesus. We owe him our worship, our adoration, our allegiance, our obedience. Our lives should confess that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. See, this is our reason for living as a Christ follower. If we go up to chapter 1, verse 27 in Philippians, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, live a life worthy of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Since Jesus died for us, 
How should we live and respond? What's our, what's our response to this? And, and to help us have the mind of Christ, we must filter every thought in light of, does it fit the thinking of a Christ follower? Should a Christian be thinking this way? Does it fit what the Bible says? You see, if we have the mind of Christ, we will want to obey Christ. We want to live as he directs us because we love him. We live in faith that the Bible is filled with God's truth. We live in faith that if I follow what the Bible says, that will lead to truth in my life. You see, when we orient or line up our lives with the Bible and follow the teachings of Jesus, we will find that we begin to think like Jesus. So, as we move forward together, may we have the mind of Christ. When there are differing points of view, we need to handle them with Christ in the center. That old adage, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say to us in the middle of disagreements or differing views? Well, we stop, we pray, and we ask God to show us the way. And then, the hard part, we step back and wait for him to reveal this way through the Holy Spirit. We do this together. Now, it will mean we'll have to be obedient to God through the Holy Spirit as he reveals to us. Too often we pray, we give God the need, we give God the way we want him to answer. We need to listen. Because sometimes it might run contrary. But for all of this to happen, for all of this to happen, Jesus has to be the Lord, the leader of our lives. This is, this is how we get the mind of Christ. We surrender to him and let him be the guide for us. He is Lord. I thought it would be fitting that we close today uh, by turning to page 269. Invite Bexie back up. The simple chorus, He is Lord. And we're going to sing it through twice and then, uh, then we'll remain standing and have our closing. Season. I thought it would be appropriate to put the exclamation point to say he is Lord. Number 